South Central Alaska has a lot of great shallow vegetated lakes, places that pike will do very well. But right now, today, they function as coho rearing habitats, as rainbow habitats, as places for Chinook to rear. And those places could all change. They could all become dominated by pike if we weren't doing what we're doing. Hi, I'm Christine Dunker. I'm the uh, South Central Alaska Invasive Species Coordinator for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Sportfish. When we have places like um, Three Mile Lake here, that's pretty uniform in habitat. You know, it's not really that deep. It has a lot of aquatic vegetation. All the things that northern pike really like and thrive for uh, spawning, rearing, and, and uh, feeding. We tend to see pretty drastic impacts on the native fish communities. So what often happens is when pike are introduced to a system like this, you know, they initially do quite well because usually they have a lot of fish prey, which is ultimately their, their, their preference. Uh, pike are opportunistic. They will eat anything that they can from fish to rodents to ducklings, but you know, they, they, they really do tend to target uh, fish prey first. And so in those first couple of years, they, they do pretty well. Um, until really those uh, salmon or trout go away completely. Typically we see almost complete, if not fully complete extirpation of soft rayed fish like that. At that point, a pike's diet will shift to sticklebacks, which are usually quite prevalent in uh, lakes in South Central. They're pretty small fish, but they have these kind of spiny dorsal fins, and those spines make them a little trickier to eat. So they tend to be preferred less than a soft rayed fish like a juvenile salmon. But if no juvenile salmon are there, then the sticklebacks tend to dominate the diets until they're gone as well. And then northern pike really have nothing else to subsist on outside of um, water bugs, um, basically your aquatic invertebrates like dragonfly larvae, any of the aquatic beetles, things like that. They're not very good quality prey for a top predator like a northern pike. So the northern pike typically start growing much smaller. Um, they're really no longer that pike that most anglers want to go after. But they become very, very numerous at those small kind of, you know, thin sizes. And uh, they're just not healthy. The ecosystem isn't healthy, but their diets tend to be dominated almost completely by invertebrates and occasionally another pike, not very many. They certainly don't eat enough of each other to regulate their own populations, but occasionally we'll find a pike in a stomach. You know, the ducklings, the little birds, the frogs, the, the rodents, whatever they have the ability to go after, but generally they're subsisting mainly off of those invertebrate prey. It doesn't take very long for the salmon and trout populations or other native fish in a lake that becomes invaded with pike before those native fish populations go away entirely. So what is our consequence if we're not doing anything? Uh, to answer that, well, I should probably explain what we are doing. And um, there's a number of different strategies that we employ for um, invasive northern pike to, to try to fix this problem. And amongst the most important of those is preventing them from spreading and getting any worse than, than it is. Um, while northern pike are in a lot of places, I think, you know, we've documented over 150 water bodies in South Central that have invasive northern pike. There is a lot more habitat out there that they would do extremely well in and that they're not in. So preventing that spread, preventing that problem from getting worse is kind of number one. And where we can second to that, if we can eradicate populations, um, both to prevent their spread and also to restore fisheries, that is another huge piece in one of our, um, one of our main goals. But it's somewhat limited as to the types of places that we can fully eradicate, meaning we take out all of the pike of a population. And so that leaves us then um, with the option to suppress the populations where, where eradication is not feasible due to cost or the extensiveness of the system, uh, we can get in and try to reduce the population and thereby reduce predation pressure on the juvenile salmon or, or, or trout that, that may, may reside there. If we didn't do any of this, if, if none of that was happening, um, northern pike would continue to spread. They initially got here through illegal introductions by people, and while that still happens to a degree, most of the movement today is happening by pike moving around themselves, either moving through open systems into rivers to new areas, or now through Cook Inlet to new areas. They're moving around and dispersing on their own. And so it's really critical that we try and prevent that so that the problem doesn't continue to grow exponentially worse.
It's really critical for all of our fisheries and in all of our communities, all of our populations here who, you know, enjoy fishing for salmon, who subsist off of salmon, whose lifestyles revolve around salmon, that we don't let this northern pike problem get worse than it already is and that we work collectively across all partners and with anglers, anglers with everybody to really try to prevent it from getting worse. And um, it really takes a, takes a team to get that all together.